All right, class, welcome to King Arthur. Today we're going to recap what we've read so far. I will provide you some questions that might be understudy question quiz to get you prepared so that as you hear the questions and as we read together or as you read on your own or follow along, that you can look for answers to those questions. And then we'll read chapters 12 through 16. And so that is the plan for this video and for this video lesson. And so remember that if you need to take a break, if you start not focusing well on what we're reading, uh, please pause the video, walk around, get a snack, get some water, and then come back so that you are completely focused on what we're reading so that you can do well uh, in your study question quiz, but most importantly, learn the values and virtues that we can learn from King Arthur. So with that being said, let's talk about what we've read so far. What are some things that we, we read and learned about these last few chapters? We read chapters seven through 11. Do you remember what happened? Well, there was a really long chapter about Sir Tristram at the very beginning of last video. And we learned uh, a lot, all the battles and the things that took place with him. And the things that really stood out to me with the previous reading was Sir Galahad. And who is Sir Galahad? He was Sir Lancelot's son. And remember, he came to the round table and then ended up going down to the river and pulling the stone or sorry, he's pulling the sword out of the stone, and that sword was, um, you know, made for him. And so we learned a lot about Sir Lancelot being tricked uh, by, you know, this potion or, um, yeah, would you say potion, magical potion to make him fall in love and, and gave and, you know, laid with this lady and they had a son, Galahad, and then later on, uh, Galahad showed himself to Sir Lancelot and realized that it was his son and then the sword was that he pulled out of the the stone by the river was for for Galahad and so that's kind of where we left off oh and we oh, sorry we left off on the quest for the Holy Grail they uh, they were at having dinner at the round table and their the Holy Grail showed itself but was covered and the knights were you know kind of upset that they couldn't really see the Grail um, in its full glory. They wanted to actually see the grail not being hidden or covered. And so they decided to go on a quest. And King Arthur and Sir Lancelot realized that this quest can mean the end of the round table and mean the, and mean the end of a lot of the knights. But the knights were determined and we left off with the quest uh, beginning. And so now we have Sir Gawain on the quest, and that's where we're going to start with chapter 12. But before we get in, let's talk about some questions that might be on your study question quiz to get you prepared. So the first question is, what is Gawain like as he sets out on his quest? How is he different by the time he gets to the abbey or the monastery? Another question could be, how did Gawain, Gareth, and Ewain break their oath for a holy quest? The next question, what does the second generation of knights believe in? What is remarkable about Percival? What unusual things happened to him? Who are the three white bulls and who will be the only one to return from the quest? Um, explain the custom of the castle in chapter 14. So um, that will happen later and figure and focus on the customs of the castle. Um, who is present when the gale, sorry, when the grail appears? So someone's going to be present when the grail actually appears. What motivates the lord of the castle to imprison the three knights? Why does Lancelot fight in disguise from one of the visiting joust teams? And the last question that could be on your study question quiz is what causes the doom of Elaine, lily made of astolet? All right, so those questions, so be looking for those things. If you need to pause this video, go back and re-listen to those questions and write them down so that you can have them with you. I, can re I would recommend doing that. Or if you have a good memory, you can just uh, remember those questions and try to look for the answers as we read. And again, we're gonna be reading chapters 12 through 16. <clears throat> so if it starts getting boring or if you're not focusing, remember, take a pause. Um, and then come back to the video, okay? And I am going to remove my camera. 
so that we can just focus on the story, right? It seems like most of you guys like this, so. All right, let's start reading a little bit more about the quest for the Holy Grail, and let's start with Sir Gawain on the quest. Sir Gawain meant well when he started on the Grail quest. He was proud and impatient, jealous and hot-tempered, but he was not cruel or wicked. If the quest had brought plenty of fighting and adventure, he would have done well. Whatever hardships or dangers he had to put up with, but nothing like that happened. He set off in heart, hot spirits, determined to dare any dangers. He rode all day and met no one. The second day and the third day he met no one, only silent woods and deserted paths. He began to be depressed and irritated. At last he saw roofs and hurried there. It was an abbey, and the monks told him that Sir Galahad had recently been there. They told him of all kinds of adventures that had happened to Sir Galahad. Sir Gawain was angry, jealous of the new knight who sat in the perilous siege. How foolish he had been not to go with Sir Galahad from the beginning. He was dismounting, moody, and disappointed. One of the monks guessed his thoughts and remarked that even if he caught up with Sir Galahad, they would not be likely to stay together long since Sir Gawain was full of unpleasantness. And Sir Galahad was not. This annoyed Sir Gawain very much, but he was cheered by the unexpected arrival of Sir Gareth, his youngest brother, with whom he was at least able to talk about things of the court. Next morning they rode off together. They met Sir Wayne Le Avort, who had also had no adventures at all, and they all three agreed to keep together, which was not the original idea of the quest. That day they passed near the castle of the maidens, where seven knights were on patrol. They had no quarrel with them, and they were supposed to be sworn... Sorry, let's reread that. They had no quarrel with them, and they were supposed to be sworn... They were supposed to be sworn to a holy quest, on which it was plain that no unnecessary killing should be done. But they were so bored that they not only fought the seven, but killed them all, which was quite unnecessary. They felt guilty about this and decided to separate after all. That evening, Sir Gawain came to a hermitage and asked for shelter for the knight. I am a knight of King Arthur, who is on the quest of the Holy Grail, and my name is Gawain. The hermit looked at him and saw right into his heart in a disconcerting way. Sir, he answered gravely, I would rather know how things are between you and God. I am quite willing to tell you all about my life if you want me to, answered Sir Gawain, and so he did. When Sir Gawain finished by describing his battle of three against seven, the hermit said that Sir Galahad alone had unhorsed the seven, but did not kill them. He said that Sir Gawain would get nowhere by going on in this spirit, and he must start all over again. You must make amends for killing this... Sorry. You must make amends for this killing, he said. Sir Gawain stiffened with pride. Sir, he replied, it is quite impossible for us knights on adventures to make amends. We have enough to put up with and the hardships we have to undergo. Very well, said the hermit, and said no more. All the summer he searched England for adventures, and he was completely frustrated. He met Sir Ector, who said that he had met twenty knights who all complained of the same thing. I wonder where the brother of yours, Sir Lancelot, is, said Gawain. Wherever Sir Lancelot was, things were certain to be happening. I have not heard a word of him, said Sir Ector, nor of Sir Galahad, Sir Percival, or Sir Bors. Well, if they cannot find the grail, it is a waste of time for the rest of us to try. One Saturday evening in October, wet and rough with darkness coming down early, they came to a ruined chapel by the side of the track. Although most of the roof was gone, there was one section that kept the rain out, so they decided to spend the night there. They alighted, took off their saddlebags containing their provisions, and made themselves as comfortable as they could. They talked a while, wondering where they were and how much longer it would go all go on. They fell asleep, and both of them dreamed a dream. Sir Gawain dreamed that he went into a field rich with good grass and flowers. In it was a herd of bulls and a hundred and fifty black and three white. The white bulls were feeding and the black ones were not, but looked restless and uneasy. They all said, Let us go and look for a better pasture than this. And when they began to move out all the field, he saw that there were so... Th <clears throat> sorry. And when they began to move out of the field... He saw that they were so thin and weak that they could hardly stand. The three white bulls went too. After a time, some black bulls came back, but only one white one returned. Sir Ector's dream was that he and Sir Lancelot, his brother, 
took two horses and said to each other, Let us go and seek what we shall not find. Then a man came and beat Sir Lancelot and took away his armor, made him put on a rough garment full of knots and get on to a donkey. He and Sir Ector rode until they came to a well and both had a violent desire to drink. When Sir Lancelot stooped to drink, the waters sank so that he could not reach it. He got up and went back the way he had come. When they both awoke, Sir Gawain and Sir Ector told each other their dreams and pondered over them. I shall not feel happy until I get some news of Lancelot, said Sir Ector gloomily. As they sat talking in the dark, suddenly they clutched each other, for they in the air in front of them floated a candle, clear and steady, held by a hand and forearm, covered in red silk, with a crude bridle over the arm. The hand carried the candle past them and disappeared among the chapel ruins. A voice said, Knights full of bad faith, you may not find the Holy Grail. When they had recovered from their shock, Sir Gawain said, Sir Ector, did you hear what I heard? Yes, indeed, answered Sir Ector. I heard it all. We had better find a hermit to explain it, because it seems to me we are all doing all this for nothing. Sorry, because it seems to me we are doing all this for nothing. Next morning they rode on. In a valley they met a knight, who used the proper salutes and gestures and offered a joust with them. Sir Gawain eagerly accepted the challenge. At the first charge, his spear went right through the stranger's breast and came out the back. When Sir Gawain bent over him, he spoke muffled through his helmet. I am as good as dead. I am of King Arthur's court and was a fellow of the round table, and we were sworn friends. I am Sir Ewain le Avort, and I was on the quest of the Holy Grail. May God forgive you, for everyone will say one sworn brother knight was killed another. Off came his helmet, and Sir Gawain saw that it was true. Alas, that this should happen to me, he exclaimed in despair, not thinking how eagerly he had accepted the joust. After this, Sir Gawain had no more heart for the quest. He and Sir Ector found a hermit who explained their dreams and the vision. The herd of the bulls was a round table, and the good grass and flowers were humility and patience, which are always fresh and green, and in which people said the round table had been founded. But the black bulls were too proud to feed on the pasture. The white ones were Sir Percival, Sir Bors, and Sir Galahad. The search for better pasture was the quest of the grail, undertaken by most without humility. Of, their, of the three chosen knights, only one would return. In Sir Ector's dream, the holy grail was the object they could not find. But Sir Lancelot abandoned his pride and took on humility, wearing poor clothes and riding a donkey. The well was the Holy Grail, and when he saw that he could not reach it, he went back and was ready to start all over again. The candle was the good life, and the bridle was the control was the control of oneself. The effort to control one's own will had failed in these two nights. They listened glumly. Sir Gawain asked why on this quest they had met with no events at all. The hermits said that their hearts were full of pride and the Holy Grail withdrew from people like them. Sir, in that case, it is useless for us to go on in the quest. The hermit answered, That is so. There are a hundred or more like you who will get nothing out of it but dishonor. So Sir Gawain and Sir Ector asked the direction of Camelot and turned their horses that way. Wow, that was pretty cool. Pretty cool to hear about these dreams. Sorry turning this light off um their dreams that they had and how it was kind of a, a prophecy of what was about to take place and probably things that will still take place that a hundred or more of those knights of the round table are going to come away empty-handed and as the hermit said uh, have dishonor of their knighthood so let's learn about sir percival chapter 13 when king arthur was a lad <clears throat> sorry when King Arthur was a lad, Merlin the wizard spoke a prophecy. He said that two brothers would come who will have no equal in valor and good living, and their names would be Sir Percival of Wales and Sir Lamorc, uh, Lamorec of Wales. Years went by and the lads who were young with Arthur grew into men around him, and the first generation of knights, among them Sir Lamorec, established order and ruled Britain. Their life, their life was hard and rough. They were constantly on horseback and in arms. One by one, the knights of the round table hunted out people who defied the king, 
and they enforced law all over the country. It was a task that took all of their time. As time went on, however, this way of living drew to an end. Gradually, order became established and the wicked were either killed or made to obey the law. The next generation of knights found a different kind of world facing them, in which they had to live well and a peaceful life without threat of an enemy. These young men grew up different. Sorry, these young men grew up quite different from their fathers. Thinking and acting rightly were the more important were more important to them than fighting. This was very difficult for the older knights to understand. Only a few, like King Arthur and Sir Lancelot, who had always tried to think rightly as well as fight bravely, realized that the young ones were as good as the old and were better suited to the new times. Most of the older generations simply disliked them. When Sir Percival came to court, he seemed another of the new type. Sir Aglavale, Aglavale, there you go, Sir Aglavale brought him and asked King Arthur to make his young squire a knight. As King Arthur looked at the young man, who was so obviously different from his elder brother, Sir Lamarack, he saw something in him besides the strong arm and quick eye of the fighter and answered, For the love of Sir Lamarack, he shall be made a knight tomorrow. So he was, but the king and the knights thought it would be a long time before he proved a good knight. That evening at dinner, the king directed Sir Percival to sit with the unproved knights at the far end of the hall. Now among Queen Genevieve's ladies, there was one who could not speak. On this particular evening, this maiden astonished everyone by coming into the hall as if she were fallen an angel guide. She went past all the distinguished people until she reached Sir Percival. She took him by the hand and spoke in a clear voice. Arise, Sir Percival, and go with me. He did so, and every eye in the hall watched them. She led him to the round table itself, put him by the seat on the right hand of the perilous siege, and said, Fair knight, take here thy siege, for that siege belongs to thee and to none other. She then fell dead. Naturally, everyone took a great deal more to notice of Sir Percival after this. It soon became clear that he was an unusual person. He saw visions. He saw all sorts of things that he did not always understand. Spiritual creatures used to become visible to him, put him to test and disappear. Some were good and from heaven, more were evil and from hell. But he was afraid of nothing. The other world of his seemed to give him freedom from the fears of this one. He set out with all the knights of the round table on the quest of the Holy Grail. One day he was riding with Sir Lancelot. Towards them rode Sir Galahad, who had already gone through Sir Percival's halfway world into the world on the other side, that was sure and clear and heavenly. Sir Lancelot was realizing more and more that the things his son knew were more important than the quests and battles of the other knights, and that these things were the bi uh, basis of King Arthur's laws. But when he and Sir Percival met Sir Galahad, they did not recognize him because he was dis uh, disguised. They challenged him, whereupon he charged his father and unhorsed him, and drawing his sword, knocked Sir Percival out of the saddle. Sir Galahad then spurred his horse and rode fast out of sight. When they were able, Sir Lancelot and Sir Percival rode after him. On his way, Sir Percival was crossing a deep valley at midday, when a party of twenty horsemen came cantering out of the thicket of trees towards him and shouted a challenge, demanding whence he came. From the court of King Arthur, he answered, and a yell came back, Slay him! He went down under a thunder of hooves and clash of arms. His good horse was killed, and though it half crushed him, it saved him from death by trampling. In a daze, scarcely knowing if it was another vision or actually happening, he saw a knight in the armor of Sir Galahad and heard him shout, and then heard hard riding and the clash and crash of falling men in armor, and shouts of dismay and rough orders to retreat. He crawled out from under his dead horse just in time to see the red knight chasing the robbers back into the uh, copse. He shouted, but Sir Galahad rode on. Could be Cope, sorry. Cope's right there. Knights chasing the robbers back into the copse. He shouted, but Sir Galahad rode on. Now Sir Percival was in a very bad state, for he had no horse. In his armor he could walk only with difficulty. He sat by the road and waited for someone to pass, but no one had a horse to spare. When it grew dark, he went to sleep, 
and he was awoken at midnight by a woman. She called him by his name and asked him fiercely what he was doing. He answered, I do neither good nor ill. If you will promise me to do what I ask some time when I shall call on you, I will lend you my own horse. Sir Percival was so delighted with the idea of a horse to get away from the, this desolate spot that he agreed at once. The woman went away and soon came back in the starlight with an immense horse completely harnessed as a knight's charger. Without waiting, Sir Percival mounted and rode off. As he came out of the valley, the moon rose and the horse put on speed. Faster and faster went the drumming hoofs. Hedges, streams, and open fields rushed up and what were left behind. Still the pace increased and Sir Percival realized that this was no ordinary horse and that he was in the grip of an enchantment. He could not slow his steed, but clung to its saddle and felt the world rush by. In an hour they traveled four days' journey. Sir Percival was... Sorry, let me go back. Sir Percival saw a stretch of roaring water coming and knew that the horse was going to hurl him into it. Quickly, he made the sign of the cross. So let's pause right there. There's a little vocabulary sentence or phrase. Sign of the cross is a gesture made by Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, and Anglican Christians that traces the form of a cross between the forehead, breast, and shoulders to remember Jesus' death on the cross and ask for God's blessing. So, if I were to turn on my camera really quick, the cross is going, like it said, from the forehead to the breast and between the two shoulders. Right there is the sign of the cross. The horse gave a ghastly shriek and flung Sir Percival on the ground. To this horror, he saw the animal turn into a devil that went into the water crying and roaring, and where it went, the water burned in a track of fire. Here's a picture of Sir Percival on the horse. So Sir Percival now saw that he was on a black mountainside ringed around by the sea. He turned back from the coast, and as he was making his way through a valley, he saw a big snake dragging a struggling young lion cub by the neck. In a moment, a full-grown lion came roaring and growling and began to attack the serpent. Sir Percival went to help the lion and killed the snake with his sword. When the lion saw that, he instantly became friendly, and by walking around and rubbing his head against Sir Percival and purring, he did all that a beast might do to make friends with a man. That night stroked him on the neck. The knight stroked him on the neck and shoulders, so they stayed and rested all morning, and the lion kept him company all day, and when darkness fell, they slept together. The knight had horrible dreams and awoke shuddering, but found the lion and stroked his mane and, and was reassured by him. Next day at noon he was a sorry, next day at noon he saw a ship coming over the sea towards him. As it neared land, he hurried down to meet it. It was covered in black silk, and in it sat a lady, most beautiful, dressed in great magnific magnificence. She called him by his name and said she would bring him to Sir Galahad. He was so thankful to be rescued um, rescued from this dreadful place that he never thought of questioning her. In the course of conversation, he made the sign of the cross. Instantly, she rose up in a whirlwind and changed into a thick, swirling black cloud, screaming, You have betrayed me, and she fled over the sea, yelling and leaving a trail of fire. But her ship remained. Sir Percival said goodbye to the lion, went on board, and set from that grim shore. Wow, how crazy it would be to make friends with a lion. That would be kind of awesome but I think I'd always be kind of scared but it's pretty cool so that was Sir Percival alright so chapter 14 the death of Dindrain <clears throat> Sir Gawain had seen in his dream three white bulls who were the three knights who would succeed in the quest of the grail these three knights were Sir Bors, Sir Percival and Sir Galahad and the only one to return from the quest would be Sir Bors. Sir Bors was the nephew of Sir Lancelot, and like him, he also came from France. His full name was Sir Bors de Ganis. When Sir Bors began the adventure of the Holy Grail, he slept one night in an abbey and was awakened by a voice urging him, Make your way at once to the sea, for Sir Percival awaits you there. 
He got up, armed, went silently to the stables and saddled his horse and rode out through a broken wall and heard the sound of the sea. A shape glimmered on the water and he rode his horse down to the sand. It was a ship that glowed with a strange whiteness. All was still and silent. A gangway ran down to the, onto the beach. Sir Bors went on board. So let's pause really quick. We can see that that word is bolded. Gangway is a path made of wooden boards. So there was a path made of wooden boards that he ran down on, that ran down to the beach. All right, so continue to read. As soon as his feet touched the deck, the ship drew away from the shore, but with no sign of a crew at work. The night wind whistled past his face, and it seemed to him that the ship was flying, not sailing. He could see nothing, so he lay down and went to sleep. When he awoke, he saw a knight and recognized Sir Percival. With great joy, they greeted each other and told how each was brought to the strange meeting, brought to that strange meeting. In the meantime, Sir Galahad was also being brought to the ship. He was rused, like Sir Bors at night, by a lady who told him to take his horse at once and follow her. Sir Galahad obeyed. The lady led him through the night to the dark shore, where a ship rode in the dimness between night and morning. As he came up, the voices of Sir Bors and Sir Percival came across the water. Sir Galahad, you are welcome, for we have waited long for you. The lady and Sir Galahad left their horses and went on board. <clears throat> the knights greeted each other with great joy and made the lady welcome, through no one, though no one knew her and she gave no name. As the sun rose, they sat and told each other all their adventures and ended with renewed joy to have found each other. Then the lady turned to Sir Percival. Do you know who I am? She asked. No, indeed, he said. To my knowledge, I never saw you before. I am your sister, she replied, daughter of King Pellinore, and you are the man that I love most. Sir Percival was overjoyed to have found his sister, for he had gone in search for, of her many times. She had two names, Blanche Fleur and Din Drain, and she was sent now to be the guide of the three knights. In this ship were many marvels. Din Drain showed them a sword that made its owner unable to be wounded or to become weary. The knights agreed that Galahad should wear it, so Din Din Drain found sorry bound it onto Galahad, and he said he would be her knight all the days of his life. So here's a picture of Din Drain. While they were resting, a voice was heard telling them to go to the wounded keeper of the Hallows to cure him as soon as possible. So they set off again with Din Drain. The three knights and Dindre now thought that they were drawing near their goal in the quest of the Holy Grail. On their way, they passed the castle. A knight was on patrol outside, and at the sight of them, he spurred to the highway. Instead of challenging them, he asked, Lords, this gentlewoman with you, is she a maiden not wed? Dindre smiled and said, Yes, sir, I am. The knight leaned over and seized her bridle rein and said, by the Holy Cross, you shall not escape me before you have yielded to the custom of the castle. Sir Percival moved his horse up. Let her go, he said. Wherever a maiden goes, she goes freely. As they spoke, there was a clatter of hoofs. Armed men from the castle surrounded them, and with them came women carrying a big silver dish. They all declared, This gentlewoman must yield us the custom of this castle. Why? said Galahad. What is the custom of this castle? Sir, any maid who passes must be must fill this dish with blood from her right arm. All three knights instantly declared that while they lived, no such attempt should be made on Dindrain. The castle knights attacked them, and a battle began with rage until dark. A truce was called. The people of the castle offered shelter in the castle for the night, under guarantee of safety and safe escape exit next morning. Dindrain advised them to accept, and so they all went in. The custom of the castle was then more fully explained. The lady who owned the place had been ill for a long while of an unknown sickness. A hermit had once said that if she were anointed from that dish full of blood from a maiden who was a king's daughter, she would be healed. To the alarm of the three knights, Dindrain, on hearing the story, offered to be blood. Sir Galahad tried to persuade her that if she lost so much blood, she would die, but she only smiled and answered, Truly, if I die for her healing, I shall win great health of soul and honor to my family. 
and one harm is better than two, so there will be no more fighting, but tomorrow I shall yield to the custom of this castle. Every one in the castle made great celebrations over this, and the party was lodged like royal guests. Next morning, Dindrain asked for the sick lady to be brought. When she arrived, she was in great pain and distress, but not so great as the three companions of Dindrain. The bloodlet thing, the bloodletting began, and as the dish filled, Dindrain grew faint, and it was obvious her life was running out with her blood. When the dish was full, she said, Madam, I come to my death to heal you. Therefore, for God's love, pray for me. Her eyes moved from one loving face to another. All were weeping. Fair brother, she whispered, I die for the healing of this lady. When I am dead, put me in a boat and let me drift where chance will lead me. And as soon as you three come to the city of Ceres to achieve the Holy Grail, you will find me there too. Bury me there. For there Sir Galahad will be buried, and you too. Sir Percival nodded, weeping. They all gazed on each other and held in her hands, and so she died. On the same day, the sick lady of the castle became well. Then Sir Percival wrote a letter saying all that she had done and put it in her right hand. Then he laid her in a barge and carried, covered it with black silk. The wind arose and drove the barge from the land, and all the knights watched it until it was out of their sight. Then they returned to the castle, and suddenly there fell a tempest of thunder and lightning and rain, as though all the world had broken. Early the next day the knights separated, and each rode off alone. Where the city of Saras was they did not know, nor how they should get there, though they knew that if Dindrain had spoken of it, they were sure to find it. At about the same time Sir Lancelot, also on the quest of the grail, lay asleep, and in a vision he was told to rise and arm and enter the first ship that he found. When he woke, he saw about him a marvelous clear light that also entered his mind and made him happy to obey. As he rode by the riverside in the darkness, he came to a little beach, and there was a boat without sail or oar. He went on board, and immediately his entire being was filled with the utmost joy and sweetness. He felt that he had everything that he had ever wanted. When the morning light came, he found that he was in the barge where Dindre lay. For a month he lived in the barge, floating without sail or oar, wherever the wind led, watching over the body of Dindrain. One night, as the barge rocked on a little beach, he held, sorry, he heard a horse's hoofs, and a man came riding down to the water's edge. Sir Lancelot sat, sat motionless. The man dismounted, took his saddle and bridle, and leaped into the boat. In the darkness, Sir Lancelot said, Sir, you are welcome. He heard the other draw a quick breath, and his voice came urgently. Sir, what is your name? My name is Sir Lancelot du Lac. Sir, then you are my father. Ah, sir, are you Sir Galahad? Sir Lancelot got up, knowing that his happiness was now perfect. For six months they lived alone together in the boat with the body of Dindrain, and the time seemed nothing to them. The boat carried them to strange islands where they had previously... Oh, sorry. Where they had perilous adventures with beasts and wild men. At other times they drifted and watched the sky told each other all their thoughts, and were happy in each other's company. But Sir Lancelot knew that a mysterious fate was waiting for his son. One morning they came around a bend of a river and saw a knight all in white on horseback and leading a white horse. Sir Lancelot knew that this strange happy time was over. The knight hailed Sir Galahad. Sir, you have been long enough with your father. Come out of the, the boat, take this horse, and go in the quest of the Holy Grail. Sir Galahad came to the came to Sir Lancelot and kissed him lovingly and said, Sweet father, I do not know when I shall see you again. Sir Galahad went ashore, mounted the white horse, and rode into the forest, and they were parted forever. Sir Lancelot was driven before the wind for another month, and then one midnight the boat came to rest below a rock. In the moonlight he saw a castle built on the cliffs above and a postern gate on the rock itself. He made his way through the winding passages and halls to the chief fortress, Every door stood open, leading from silent stair to silent room. At last he came to a door that was shut. He was, sorry, he set his hand on it. He could not open it. He put out his huge strength, but the door did not even shake. Sir Lancelot knelt down outside the door, for now he knew that the Holy Grail itself was within, and he had come to the end of his quest. But he did not know whether he would be allowed to see the holy object or not. Father Christ, he said, if ever I did anything that pleased thee, 
Lord, forgive my sins, but show me something of that but show me something of that I seek. With that the door opened, and out came a brilliant clearness that spread through the castle until the place was as bright as if all the torches in the world were there. Sir Lancelot rose and would have entered, but a voice forbade him. Sir Lancelot, enter not. He knelt down on the threshold. There was a silver table in the room, and on it the Holy Grail covered with red silk, rose red, the Grail's own color. About it were many angels holding burning candles. Before the Grail stood a man dressed as a priest. Seeing him about to fall, Sir Lancelot stepped into the room. A fiery blast instantly beat him back, and he fell to the ground, blind, deaf, and totally paralyzed. Next morning, the inhabitants of the castle found him lying outside the shut door. They looked after him until he recovered consciousness. He asked where he was, and they told him that he was in the castle of Carbonek. Slowly he arose and went to Great Pels, sorry, to greet Pels, the lord of the castle and the father of Elaine, the mother of Galahad. Pels greeted him with joy. He told Sir Lancelot that Elaine was dead, which grieved him. Long they sat, talking over past days and the strange times that came on them. Sir Lancelot stayed four days as Pell's guest before <clears throat> sorry, Sir Lancelot stayed four days as Pell's guest before he sat out on the old familiar ride to Camelot. The king and queen Genevere were waiting for the return of the knights who had scattered on the quest for the grail. Life had gone dreary for many months in Camelot, and the news was more often of knights killed on the quest than returned in safety. The news of the arrival of Sir Lancelot ran through the palace, and at last the great knight knelt before the king and queen. As King Arthur held his friend's hand and looked in his face, he saw that strange experiences had happened to him. That evening the king and queen sat with Sir Lancelot late into the night, listening to what he could tell them of his doings, of Sir Galahad, Sir Percival, and Sir Bors, the barge and the dead maiden, and the unknown worlds where he had been. Nice. Crazy adventures on the search for the Holy Grail. Sad moments, but also beautiful and great moments. Okay, chapter 15. We have two more chapters. And like I said at the beginning, if you need to take a break, pause this video and come back. Um, please do so so that you can focus. I know it's a lot of reading, but we're doing a little bit each time. And if you're taking breaks, it's fine as long as you're, you're getting through um, these chapters and staying on track. All right, the achievement of the grail. Chapter 15. This is the story of the final achievement of the grail that Sir Bors told the king on his return from Saris. One day the three knights, Galahad, Bors, and Percival, all rode out of a forest from different directions and met on a crossroads. They saluted each other and knew that the appointed time was near. They rode together to Carbonek and were welcomed by Pels. That night the Holy Grail appeared in the castle. The three knights of King Arthur were present, and three knights from Gaul, three from Ireland, and three from Denmark. On the silver table the Grail appeared, and before it stood an old man. Now you have seen what you most desire to see, said the old man to Galahad, but yet you have not seen it as openly as you shall see it in the city of Saris. Therefore you must go hence and bear with you the, this holy vessel, for this night it shall depart from this, the realm of Britain, and it shall never more be seen here. And do you know why? Because the people of this land have turned to evil living. Therefore tomorrow you three go to sea, where you will find your ship ready. Also take with you the blood of this spear to anoint the wounded king, and he shall have his health. And two of you will die in this service, and one of you will come again and tell the tale. Then he blessed them all and vanished. The knights obeyed exactly as they were told. First Sir Galahad dipped his finger in the blood of the holy spear, and Pels' wound was instantly healed. So the injury done by the dolorous blow of Sir Balin was cured. Then they rode down to the river and found a ship ready for the sea. They did not know where they were to go, for they did not know where the city Saris was. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. They had often heard of it, for it was spoken of it in stories, but they knew no one who had found it and come back. As the ship drew in beside the paved bank on the shore, they saw the barge where Sir Percival had laid the body of his sister, Dendrain. 
Truly, said Sir Percival, my sister has kept her word. Then they took the table of silver out of their ship and carried it ashore. When the grail was safely housed, they went down to the harbor again and brought up the body of Dindrain and buried her as richly as was fitting for a king's daughter. The lord of the castle soon heard that they had brought the grail. He was afraid that his power would come to an end, and so he seized the three knights and imprisoned them in a deep hole. So they lived for a year. Then the lord fell ill and sent for the knights and set them free. He died, and while the city council was dismayed by the problem of who should succeed him, a voice sounded among them telling them to choose the youngest of the three knights, who was Sir Galahad. On the first anniversary of the day, Sir Galahad became king. The knights, as usual, went early to their prayers, but this time they found the Holy Grail out of the chest and a man kneeling before it, surrounded by a great fellowship of angels. The man turned to Sir Galahad, who began to tremble. Sir Galahad went to Sir Percival and kissed him. Next he went to Sir Bors and kissed him and said, My lord, salute me to Sir Lancelot, my father, and bid him remember me. He knelt down, and suddenly his soul departed, and a crowd of angels carried it up to heaven in the sight of his two friends. Then they saw a hand come down from heaven, take the holy grail and the spear, and carry them up to heaven. Since then no man can say that he has seen the holy grail. When the hollows were gone, the chance that all men could be both good and happy also ended, because men had not turned to good living at the appearance of the hollows, but had tried, like Sir Balin, to use them for personal pride or for safety. The hollows had produced quarreling and bloodshed instead of peace and love. So they went back into heaven, and the great attempt of King Arthur to make Britain as heavenly as possible, through his knights of the round table, began to break down. When the two knights realized that Sir Galahad was dead, they buried him by Dindrain, and immediately afterwards Sir Percival retired into a hermitage outside in the country and became a monk. Sir Bors was constantly with him, but did not become a monk, for he meant some day to go back to Britain. Sir Percival lived a year and two months in the hermitage, and then died. Sir Bors buried him beside Sir Galahad and Dindrain. Thus Sir Bors was left alone, in a world that knew nothing of him or his friends, of their lives and struggles and adventures. He put on his armor again and went on board a ship. He came to the realm of Britain and rode until he came to Camelot. He had been gone so long that they had given him up for dead. He looked around on the faces he had known since he had come to the court as a young nephew of Sir Lancelot, and he saw that they were all old men. A lifetime had passed, and the end had come. He stood a moment with his hand over his eyes. The king made a sign and dismissed everyone except Sir Lancelot and the secretaries. They wrote down the reports of the knights who came back from the quest of the grail, to be made into books that were kept in the library in Salisbury. Night fell and the logs burned low. On the hearth, forgotten as the king and queen and Sir Lancelot sat motionless listening. listening. The king knew that sadder days were coming for Britain. He was middle-aged, his round table was broken, and the glory of the grail was gone sorry and the glory of the grail was gone wow that was sad a lot of you know knights or lancelot's son passed sir percival is gone to sir sir bors left just like the prophecy was the only one would come back from the search of the holy grail okay chapter 16 our last chapter for today you guys have been doing great following along and those that have paused and come back i'm glad that you made that decision hope you're focused and ready to finish out uh, this week's chapters chapter 16 is our last chapter for this week <clears throat> glad that you guys are doing your best to stay on top of things you guys are doing great um, if you have any questions of assignments please reach out to me and um, let's let's finish this this section for this week chapter 16 sir lancelot and the lily maid of Astolit. The round table was scattered on the quest of the Holy Grail. A few knights had returned, but the court was empty and spiritless. It was hot summer weather, and King Arthur decided to hold a tournament to keep up their spirits and their practice in arms. Sometimes Sir Lancelot did not fight in these jousts because he always won. That discouraged the young and gave rise to tricks and foul play by the wicked. On this occasion, he thought he would fight in disguise on one of the visiting teams. It was always possible to join a team on the day of the joust. 
and a knight could keep his helmet on and not show his face. If he had a good horse and armor and knew the rules of chivalry, he was welcome. The tournament was to be in Winchester. The court was in London, so they rode, They all rode down through the leafy lanes and green fields of Surrey and Hampshire. On the way, they lodged at Astolet. Behind them, in new armor, visor down, rode Sir Lancelot, his shield with the famous gold leopards on a blue black ground hidden under a covering. Astolet was full and busy with the arrival of the court. It had a castle in which lived an old-fashioned family who did not mix much with the great world. The lady of the castle was dead, and old Sir Bernard had brought up his two sons and one daughter in a quiet, simple way. The sons, Tor and Levine, were the new knights, and the daughter, Elaine, was her father's darling, young, beautiful, and good, and dearly loved by all the people who called her Lily Maid of Astolet. The old quiet castle did not attract the people of the court, but Lancelot rode there and was given a warm welcome, though no one knew him. When they had all made friends, Lancelot explained that he wanted to joust unrecognized, which was quite unusual, and asked if he might borrow a plain shield, leaving his there to pick up on his way back. Sir Bernard said that his eldest son, Sir Tor, had been hurt in his first joust and could not go to the tournament, and that the visitor could have his shield. He asked him to take with him Levine, his younger son, whose first joust it would be. The men stood talking, and Elaine listened silently, too shy at first to look much at the stranger or to speak, but gradually she began to look up at him and saw the tall, strong figure, the dark hair and suntanned face, the deep eyes that looked on all men with love. Elaine lifted up her eyes and loved him deeply, a love that was her doom because Lancelot's true love, his, only, his one and only love, was always the queen. The evening passed and Sir Lancelot told tales of the king's wars. Early the next morning, he and Levine got ready to go. Elaine came to them and asked very shyly if Sir Lancelot would wear her favor at the tournament. So that word is bold, so let's pause and go down and learn what a favor is. A favor is a token of affection or remembrance. So Elaine wanted Lancelot to wear a token of affection or remembrance when they went to the tournament. He answered that he had never done that in his life, not saying that the reason was that he was the true knight only of the queen. Elaine replied that they would make it all the more complete a disguise for him, and moved by this idea. Moved by this idea, Sir Lancelot accepted. He tied the favor, a red sleeve sewn with pearls, on his helmet. Sir Levine brought him his brother's shield, and Lancelot asked Elaine to keep his shield for him until he came again. Then the knights rode away, followed by their squires. So here's a, a picture of Sir Lancelot taking the favor from Elaine. And it's kind of strange, right? Elaine was the the lady that um, gave Sir Lancelot potion and bore his son, Sir Galahad. So it's kind of unique that and they have the same name. All right, continue to read. On the way to Camelot, Sir Lancelot told Levine who he was. The young man gave his promise to keep the secret. Meanwhile, Elaine at home had taken the stranger's shield up to her room and had started to make a cover for it, copying the design of the gold shepherds, gold leopards on blue and embroidery. When the tournament day arrived, Sir Lancelot and Sir Levine rode out to Winchester quietly and came by a lane to a leafy a little leafy wood where the teams opposing the king were camped. Sir Lancelot was wearing the red sleeve on his helmet. They waited in hiding while the teams lined up. The trumpets blew. The opening charges were made. Against King Arthur were the lords of North Wales and of Northumberland and many others. Sir Lancelot's expert eye followed every move. Levine, his lance ready, waited quivering for the word of command. One night after another, on each side charged, and the battle began to take shape. King Arthur's side pressed the others hard. See that group of good knights, said Sir Lancelot through his visor. They hold together like boars, chased by hounds. Now with your help, we shall make those knights who are chasing these fellows on our side go back as fast as they are now coming forward. He fixed his eye on the nerve center of the fight and charged right in. His first impact sent flying five knights, Sir Kay, Sir Brandelize, Sir Sagramore, Sir Dondonit, Dodinus and Sir Grifflet. 
Young Levine sent down two good knights, Sir Lucan and Sir Bedivere. Lancelot did not pause. That was part of the, the secret of his su superiority, su sorry, su superiority in fighting. He gave no one time to recover or to think. Before, before half the side knew that he had joined in, he had unhorsed seven more and Levine another. But in the next charge, Sir Lancelot's horse was hurled to the ground, and Sir Bor's spear pierced Sir Lancelot's side and broke off. When Levine saw the horse fall, he wheeled to the king of the Scots, who had happened to be unguarded and knocked him off his horse. He grabbed the bridle and forced his way right in, and held everyone off while Sir Lancelot got onto the horse. Then began a fight that no one ever forgot. Sir Lancelot thought that he would die from his wound, and he determined to die well. Nobody could match him. He struck down Sir Bors, Sir Ector, Sir uh, Lionel, and three more. The first three got on horseback again and charged him. He sent them flying again and performed the final act of victory on each by taking off their helmets and proving that if he wished, he could cut off their heads. A knight so defeated was out of the battle. Forty knights did this, did these two champions strike down. Sir Lancelot, thirty, and Sir Levine, ten. The match was won, and the king and the round table had lost. The heralds announced that the prize was awarded to the knight wearing the red sleeve, but the knight was nowhere to be found. At the trumpet's sound, he had turned and ridden fast into the leafy wood, followed by Sir Levine, feeling his wound worsen as the heat of the battle died away. An old friend of his, once a knight and now a hermit and doctor, lived in the woods, and Sir Lancelot rode there fast. He was almost unconscious uh, when they arrived. The hermit recognized him at once. He carried him in with Sir Levine and began a fight to save his life. Meantime, King Arthur ordered a search to be made for the victor knight. Sir Gawain organized a hunt around Winchester, but without success. So the prize was not awarded, and the court returned to London. On the way back, Sir Gawain happened to lodge at the castle in Astolet. The family received him eagerly and pressed him for the news of the tournament. When Sir Gawain heard their story and discovered that the knight with the red sleeve had left his shield in the castle, he begged to see it. As soon as he saw the gold leopards on the blue background, he cried out, Sir Lancelot! So the news was told, and Sir Bors, who had wounded him, was stricken to the heart, for he loved Sir Lancelot more than anyone in the world. Elaine, the lily maid, persuaded her father to let her ride out in search of the wounded knight and Sir Levine. By luck, she came on her brother, exercising his horse in a field. She told him of Sir Gawain's coming and persuaded him to lead her to Sir Lancelot. From then on, she never left the wounded man, but nursed him by day and night. But nursed him day and night. Days passed, and he lay desperately ill. Then came Sir Bors, who found him at last, and stood beside the bed in such grief. It made Sir Lancelot's eyes twinkle, and he said, Cheer up, cousin. If I had not been so full of pride i would have said who i was and you would not have wounded me let us say no more about it gradually the battle for his life has won and at last he was out of danger slowly he grew better and was able to sit on his horse and do more each day at last came the day that elaine was dreading when they left the hermitage and went back to the castle of astolet eventually he was well enough to leave astolet and return to the return to court Elaine knew that she could not go back to her former life without him. She asked her father and her two brothers to come with her and went to Sir Lancelot. My lord, Sir Lancelot, she said, I see you are really going away. Fair knight, have mercy on me, and do not let me die for your love. Sir Lancelot had never run away from difficulties in his life. He did not, he did not now. What do you want me to do, he asked gravely. Sir, marry me, she said. My dear, thank you for my heart, but I am resolved never to be a married man. Then I shall die for love. Then I shall die for love of you. You will not, answered Sir Lancelot. I am twice your age, my dear, and you will grow to love me differently. You will not always feel like this. Some day you will meet a young man your own age, and all my life you may call on me to fight for you and be your knight. Sir, of all this I will be have I will have nothing if you will not marry me. I warn you, Sir Lancelot, my good days are done. But Sir Lancelot answered, That I cannot do. Elaine gave a cry and fell unconscious on the ground. Her woman carried her away to her room. There was silence. Sir Lancelot picked up his belt and gloves and was ready to go. Turning to young Levine, he asked him harshly if he was still willing to follow him. Sir, I will always follow you unless you order me to leave you. So Sir Lancelot and Levine rode away. Elaine lay motionless on her bed. 
For nine days and nights she lay without eating, drinking, or sleeping, uttering no sound but Sir Lancelot's name. Every day the people gathered at the castle gate and wept at the news that their lady maid was fading away. On the tenth day she wrote, she roused herself, she spoke of her love, and she did no wrong because of kinds, because all kinds of love come from God. She asked her father to write her short history in a letter and put the letter in her hand as soon as she was dead, to dress her in, a fi in her finest clothes and lay her in a barge draped in all black, to put their old servant in charge and let the river carry her to London to the king's palace at Westminster. The court and Sir Lancelot would see her and read the letter and give her burial. King Arthur and Queen Genevieve were sitting talking in a deep window seat overlooking the river, and to their view glided the black draped barge with one white figure lying in it and one old man sitting at the oars. It came to the palace steps and there remained, rocking gently, the king and queen went hand in hand to look on the lily maid who lay there. Slowly the knights gathered around, and then came Sir Lancelot. The king took the letter from her hand and read it. Elaine's last message was, Most noble knight, my lord Sir Lancelot, now has death separated us. I loved you, and I was called the lily maid of Astolet. Unto all ladies I tell my sad story, but I ask you to pray for my soul and give me burial. This is my last request. Pray for my soul, Sir Lancelot. All eyes were on Sir Lancelot as the letter ended. He told the king that Elaine's death had not been his fault and called Sir Levine, her brother, to prove it. She was both fair and good, and I owed much to her, but she loved me beyond measure. When the entire story was told, the lily maid was carried into the palace. Next day, the court attended her burial, which was performed as magnificently as for a queen. Then the servant rode the barge home to the morning castle of Astolet. All right, well, that is it. Hope you enjoyed those chapters. We only have one more section next week of King Arthur, and then we'll be moving on to um, Robin Hood after. Now, again, if you have any questions, let me know. Stay on top of your work and stay on track. Follow the, the weekly day-to-day -day, um, homework page to make sure that you're getting the things done that you should be. And Thanksgiving's coming up quick so we don't want you to be having to do a lot of work over thanksgiving um, but you guys are awesome keep it up and i will see you guys in the next video